Hey again guys, and welcome back. Today I'm taking a look at this O1 VDS 6102A and pay close attention to the A because the A denotes this as a 14-bit vertical resolution. Um, the 6000 series O1 uh, USB oscilloscopes are available in uh, 8-bit and 14-bit. 8-bit is something like your Rigol DS1054Zs, which you see are super popular. They have an 8-bit uh, vertical resolution, but these guys, the A series of the O1, um, they have a 14-bit vertical resolution, so much more resolution available. So first and foremost, uh, this is the unit itself. It is actually pretty thin. It's made out of aluminum. It's got these um, these bumpers on the ends, and they've got these. They've got this is a two channel, and it's got a output for a um, signal gen, which is built in as well. And you can tell that this is a modern oscilloscope because it has USB Type C. It's got um, connection for a network device here. Um, it's got optional Wi-Fi. Uh, this one does not have it, but it does have the option. And you've got your AC-DC adapter. Pretty neat little device, and it's uh, very rigid, which is nice. In the box included with it, we've got two probes, which we will take a look at shortly. We've got the software package on a CD-ROM, which I guess is fine, but um, I do not have any CD software. Um, uh, any CD capable computer. Um, I contacted O1 because it wasn't on their website and now it is on their website. So there we go. We've got the spec sheet which is just fine. We can take a look at that later. It comes with a power supply. Uh, this puts out uh, 8.5 volts at one and a half amps. It comes with the IEC cable for that power supply, which I appreciate that it's IEC plugged in. And it comes with a, a UL listed cord, and it has the Canadian and the US standard on this specific one. So pretty good that it is actually listed. It comes with a, a BNC to BNC connector. This is quite common for uh, signal gens. And it comes with this nice and long USB type C cable. Just quickly going over the spec sheet, uh, the bandwidth, uh, as you can see, going into 14-bit mode does drop us from 100 megahertz to 20 megahertz. But uh, to be fair, the Handtech USB scope that I have, I believe it's only an 8-bit scope, and it maxes out at 20 megahertz. So uh, this thing is well advanced for that. And um, yeah, there we go. There's our choice up to 14 bits. I don't know why you would go down to 8-bit uh, if 12-bit is the same vertical resolution, but oh well, it is what it is. Um, sampling rate. Uh, oh, I guess this is why, because you have different uh, sampling rates here. So in 14-bit mode, 100 meg samples per second, which is not that great for fast-moving signals. 12-bit mode, 250 meg samples per second and 500 in 8-bit mode and in uh, one single channel uh, you go pretty much double that except for 14-bit mode. 14-bit mode stays the same. Interesting. We're just at the limits of the um, analog digital converter I guess. Um, rise time and all of this stuff which you can pause to take a look and here's the uh, the end of the specs and the function gen specs. Uh, this seems pretty good. Uh, 25 meg samples per second, uh, 5 megahertz, up to 5 megahertz. So my Unity um, frequency generator is better, but um, if I'm already using a scope, this one has it built in. So, you know, you might as well. As for the device itself, I was this close to chastising it for using a um, barrel jack to power this thing and an 8.5 volt power supply. I mean, come on, 8.5 volts. Um, however, this thing can be entirely powered by the USB cable. Uh, in fact, I forgot my computer on overnight and this thing was just plugged in with the USB 
and my power bar was off here at the workbench and it was working all night. Uh, it gets fairly warm, but you know, only warm. So I recommend leaving these bumpers on so that you get a little bit more airflow underneath. But if you do prefer it without the bumpers, the text is still written underneath, which is also pretty cool. So yeah, you can power this off a power bank, and if you have the Wi-Fi device, apparently you can use this on an app on your phone. That's not the kind of work that I like doing, but it is nice to know that in the field, you could have a laptop plugged in, and this thing plugged in, and you could do all your testing completely wireless, which is amazing in my eyes. Something you just can't do with something like a Rigel DS1054Z, even though I love that oscilloscope as well. So let's plug this in and give it some tests. And here's the PC software, and this is what it looks like when you plug in your scope. So yeah, you just get to choose what it is. I'm going to click here, and then here is the test waveform. So obviously this test waveform is relatively centered and ready to go because I was playing with this uh, scope for quite a while. But I'll just walk you through the buttons a little bit. So here you have your auto set, which um, makes the device click a couple things. So I think there's little um, relays in there that are probing the signal and seeing what's most appropriate. And here we go. Uh, you see it is centered channel one. And here we've got uh, one volt per division. And we've got a zero division offset. Um, I just touched my mouse wheel here. And this is where I kind of want to show you the intuitive interface. So if I scroll my mouse wheel up, it zooms in on the time base. You can see the time base down here. So that's pretty nice. And scroll wheel down brings it back. You can hit your offset just by clicking and dragging. You can move your trigger just by clicking and dragging. So that's pretty neat. Um, some things recenter. Uh, for example, you can click and drag and this will move your uh, time offset. And then if you double click that, it brings back to normal. Um, doesn't do with the voltage, but that's not a big deal. Here you can pause your waveform and here you can do your single shot. And what I really love, what I didn't think we needed to say is that when you hover over something, it tells you what that button does. It gives you a little tool tip. Uh, I have new software at work, which was built very expensively and it doesn't do this. So, you know, take it as you will. So you got a little menu here. You got everything you kind of want from an oscilloscope in this menu. It's uh, very easy to move around. So there you got your times 10 on the probe. I didn't actually check if my probe is on times 10, but either way, you got your invert there. You got your measurements. This is the one downside with this scope is you have a maximum of measurements. So hit that on channel one. You see it how now when I click them, it unclicks other stuff. So that's a bit of a, of a shame. Uh, there must be a reason for it. But uh, yeah, I wish you could have unlimited measurements. I mean, it's not like we don't have the screen space. If you turn on channel two, it just goes underneath. The remove all button, though, is a nice touch. Then you've got your precision mode, 8, 12, and 14 bits. We're going to be playing with that pretty soon. Maybe we'll just set in 14 bits before we forget. Um, here's your function gen, which is pretty neat. Here's your cursors. Um, you can actually set the cursors with this little uh, button down there. Um, you can even change the brightness of the grid, which is awesome. You can have a persistence, which is great. Persistence basically lays the signals one on top of the other for a prescribed seconds in order to, um, you know, show you the averaging sort of got the X, Y mode, which is very important. And then you've got your uh, settings. So everything is really nice and reachable. Uh, you can save waveforms in comma separated values or in a zip data. Um, yeah, this thing is this thing is pretty nice. Uh, so the next thing to do is to hook up the function generator and see what this thing is capable of. Don't forget, we left it in 14 bit mode. All set up here with my Unity UTG 962E. That's a mouthful. I'm going to have to figure out some sort of abbreviation for that. But we're hooked up to both channels on the 01 VDS 6102A. Don't forget, we left off 
the scope in 14-bit mode. So we're going to be checking sort of like it's the lower end of its performance, but the higher end of its resolution, if that makes any sense to you. So I have got one kilohertz um, sine wave on both these channels. Channel one seems to be five volts peak to peak and channel two also five volts peak to peak. I'm going to turn them both on and show you how the auto adjust works really well. So here we go. One is on, two is on. Let me hit auto adjust. And there we go. So you see both waves are very clearly visible. Um, the software even put one of the waveforms on the top half and the other one on the bottom half. If you'll notice, it's triggering on channel one. You see that by the red little arrow on the right hand side. And um, both channels are synchronized. So everything's good. Even on the lower left hand corner, you can see the quick measurements. I think the only weird thing here is that the probes are in 10 times mode and this one doesn't have any probes and just have BNCs. So let me see if I can adjust that. And there we go. So now we're showing two volts per division. So yeah, just make sure you have your probe set properly because, you know, as I said, I have just a BNC to BNC cable. There are no probes. Let's see if we can set up some measurements so we can get some quick readings. So we have accurately 5 volts peak to peak on both channels. We actually have 5.1 volts peak to peak on channel 1. Uh, I'm not sure. This is uh, two different cables. I have the BNC that came with the Unity and one of the BNC to BNC that came with the VDS6102A. Now with these uh, BNCs, because they're not times 10, I don't know how high the frequency we can go. But we do know that we have a bandwidth limit of 20 megahertz. So let's crank it all the way up to 20 megahertz and see what happens. So channel one, going to hit 20 and megahertz. And channel two, going to hit 20 and megahertz. Now I do expect some voltage loss, but let's see how the scope deals with it. It seems to show us uh, very close to 5 volts peak to peak, got 4.8 and 4.7 something. I can't really see my screen from over here in the mic I'm speaking through, but it is what it is. Uh, so yeah, very usable up to 20 megahertz, 2 channel, and 14 bit. So this thing is true to its advertising. Now let's just put some interesting waveforms and see what happens here. And here we go, we have arbitrary waveforms on both channels, and it seems to be picking up no problem. It's this weird uh, voice type of thing on channel one, and um, this sort of like double ramp up, ramp down on channel two. Um, we did have to reduce a little bit because the arbitrary waveform generator cannot go up to 20 megahertz per channel, so we've got uh, 10 megahertz per channel. Um, but this is doing quite well, triggering up on channel two there. So how does it do on really slow moving signals? Well, I haven't really changed the um, screen from before. And as you can see, it is recording very smoothly. Um, but let me see what the auto adjust does. I have uh, 500 millihertz, so it's half a hertz uh, square wave on channel one. And on channel two, we have a two hertz square wave. And as you can see, it's doing that fairly well. It is triggering on channel one. It did pick a trigger 
very close to the baseline voltage, but it is working. It does seem to me though that the uh, Unity function gen can't drive this this hard. Maybe a resistor in line would be good, or you know, actually using a scope probe instead of the BNC to BNC. But it is triggering properly. It is seeing it. Let me just move the trigger a little bit and see if we get a little bit of a difference. Yeah, it seems to be triggering just fine. That's pretty good. Um, let's set ourselves um, a couple wave forms and we'll go play with the measurements. Okay, I set two random frequencies that uh, I'm not sure what they are and we're gonna see how well the software kind of detects it. So I'm gonna start with the auto set. The auto set seems to work really well, so why mess with a good thing? Okay, so for the red channel, See if I can pop up the cursors here. Um, we have, I guess it should say down there. I have my mouse set super sensitive, so if I overshoot, that's why. Oops, that's not a period. What am I doing? Okay, so here we got um, 5.1 volts peak to peak and 495 kilohertz and yep sure enough it's a 500 kilohertz with a uh, 5.28 peak to peak so that was pretty easy uh, let's switch our trigger to channel 2 and then hit this on auto mode and we're going to see what our second waveform is oh look at that it's a triangle wave and we can grab our cursors I think there's auto measuring cursors too. We're going to take a look at that in a second. So here we go. I'm going to drop this one and bring this one down. And then, yeah, 250 hertz, a 5.04 peak to peak. What do we have here? 250 hertz on the dot. So I did a good job. And 5.08 volts peak to peak. So, yeah, we're in good shape here. Now let's see if we can find in here some uh, measuring the Merck cursors channel 2 voltage oh look at that automatically grabs it okay and time yeah look that's it's done perfectly and I don't think this was was that me oh that was me setting it well that was a bit silly so yeah you can turn them on separately here and uh <laughs> it's it's different it's different to those but the point remains it's still pretty friggin nice I wonder what persistence will do with the waveform jumping like crazy up there oh yeah you can see actually where the waveforms going up and down huh crazy maybe we can do infinite persistence and eventually it'll just be a red bar Hey, that's not infinite. It's disappearing, or maybe it's just not recent, so it'll just turn darker. I could truly play with this thing all night, and I don't think we're going to find its flaws. Um, I could try to bring this up to its max frequency, but as you can see, I'm stuck with uh, 60 megahertz and 200 meg samples per second on this Unity uh, function gen. So even if I wanted to push this to its limits, I wouldn't be able to because I don't have the tools that go up that high. This thing is pretty damn good. Now, should you buy it? That's a tough question because I love the Rigol DS1054Z, but this thing, at least in my market here in Canada, is about 150 bucks cheaper or something like that. The Rigol is an 8-bit scope. This is a 14-bit scope. So, I don't know. I think as long as you are near a computer, it's a little bit awkward for my setup here because my PC is all the way over there. But as long as you're near a computer, this thing, I would say, is a buy. So check out the links in the description. If you pick one up, uh, you do help the channel. And if you don't want something like this, well, stay tuned. I have some lower cost alternative on the way. Thanks for watching.